This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. We have John Lusk with us here today. John is the author of The Mouse Driver Chronicles. You guys know I'm excited. I've been using John's <laughs> book in my class for six years. I've had 19 <coughs> quarters of students read the book, averaging 80 students a quarter, it's a couple thousand students. And I love exposing students to the book because it is such a good rendering of the emotional highs and lows that you go through at a startup. You can read about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and those are fun, entertaining stories to read about. You probably will not experience that, because that, um, that is such the exception. You're probably gonna experience something much closer to what John and Kyle experienced with the Mouse Driver Chronicles. Certainly was very close to the multiple experiences I've had as a startup executive. So that's why I continue to use the book. Um, and for those of you who are in my new venture creation class this quarter, you know that I asked the question yesterday how many of you guys think I should continue to use this book? And almost every single person in the class raised their hand, which is, which is quite a testament to a book um, you know, wasn't written yesterday. Um, it's, you know, everything has a shelf life, and I feel like this book has a very long shelf life, so I'm gonna continue to use it. So John has been a, a small business advocate for over 15 years. He's currently the founder and CEO of Rivet & Sway, which is an online co a company that's selling um, um, prescription eyewear, and they're doing it in a way that's fun um, and uh, illuminating. You should check out their site. John's also been the advisor of a number of consumer-focused companies. Um, he's a board member of the Schutzman Center for Entrepreneurship at Queens College. In the past, he served on the Small Business Administration's Ni National Advisory Council, um, and he's a nationally recognized speaker. Um, another treat for you guys. This is somebody who's um, been able to tell his story to audiences all over the world. He's been, um, he's gotten exposure in print and film and um, television from a variety of um, entities, including Inc. Magazine, NPR's Morning Marketplace, CNET Radio, Sky Radio Network, Bloomberg News Radio, Tech, Tech Now TV, Silicon Valley Business News, Business Week, USA Today, PR Week, just to name a few. John graduated from SMU. He got his degree in Management Information Sciences. Um, he had a technical background, and then he went on to get his MBA in entrepreneurship from Wharton, same school that I went to, and we actually knew same, some of the same <laughs> professors, which is funny. I'm a lot older. John is not nearly as old as me. One part of John's bio that didn't surprise me at all when I came across it was that he was a semi-professional soccer player. You're going to see that sort of attribute in the backgrounds of a lot of entrepreneurs, not, not the athletic side necessarily. Um, you might be a checker champion. You might be a spelling bee champion. Uh, you might be really good at backgammon. But what it shows is a desire to win and a willingness to work hard to get there. And that's certainly in John's background. John's wife, Rhonda, is here to support him, which I think <laughs> is fantastic. Um, it's hard to be an entrepreneur. It is probably the hardest job you could ever take or the hardest job you could ever make. Um, and if you have a supportive home life, it makes it a lot more fun, but more importantly, it makes it a lot easier. So it's great to see Rhonda here with us today. John um, was born in Texas. He is a Texan. When you're born in Texas, you're always a Texan. That's right. Um, but he <laughs> currently resides in Seattle. Um, and you guys know I'm appreciative when somebody takes the time to drive across town to come speak with you and share their insights. John came all the way from Seattle. 
Uh, John and Rhonda came all the way on Seattle. I'd love to think I have a lavish budget where I flew them down in like a private jet uh, and served them uh, champagne and caviar. No, they came down on their own dime. And really John came down to honor UCSB and to honor all of you um, and past students for having enjoyed his book um, and he really wanted to come down and share his insights firsthand. So let's welcome him to our class. Well, first of all, thank you uh, so much for hosting me uh, on this Thursday evening. And, and, and John, I'm also here to honor you. Um, I can't thank you enough for being such a phenomenal evangelist for the Mouse Driver Chronicles. Uh, when Kyle and I wrote the book, we really intended it to uh, be read by, by students and, and, uh, and students of entrepreneurship because we felt like we wanted them to have a book that we could have used when we were coming out of Wharton. So the fact that uh, professors around the world are using it and the fact that you've been using it for the last six years, um, I'm really um, <coughs> deeply appreciative of that. So thank you very much. So I'd just like to see a show of hands. How many of you have read the book? Okay, and how many of you actually haven't read the book? No, nobody, right. <laughs> One, thank you. So you, you should definitely go read the book for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to give you some phenomenal insights on the emotional experience of, of being an entrepreneur, as John mentioned earlier. But two, every time you buy this book, I make 12 and a half cents. <laughs> All right? So if, if you buy like 10 of them in the next uh, you know, three or four hours, Ron and I might be able to get a cup of coffee. So um, <clears throat> sorry about this. This thing is kind of, I have to talk a little bit lighter. I'm going to um, essentially tell you a story today, but before I do that, I'm going to read a passage out of the book, which apparently most of you have probably already read this. This is from the first chapter. It's called Taking the Leap. <clears throat> I remember sitting somewhere near the last row of Wes Hutchinson's marketing class, wondering what the hell I was going to do. I just sleepwalked through a presentation from my version of an iPhone, a cell phone with three key features. One, it could access the World Wide Web for email, stock quotes, sports scores, etc. It looked and worked almost exactly like three other iPhones already on the market. And three, it was never ever going to be built by me or anyone else. It wasn't original, it wasn't exciting, but I knew I had enough to pass. So I was relaxed pitching the iPhone. Too relaxed, sometime between Professor Hutchinson barking out next up John Lusk in my last PowerPoint slide, my big problem crept back into my head and stayed there as I wrapped up and shuffled back to my seat. I was three months away from leaving Philadelphia with an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business in immediate danger and in immediate danger of getting a job. So there are a couple of key points that uh, are pretty salient and that will sort of frame the discussion tonight. One is uh, I didn't want a job coming out of Wharton. I went there because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that idea of me not wanting a job will come through this story as we progress through this evening. The second thing is that I actually created the iPhone, um, if you didn't notice. And uh, I should have registered trademarks around it, but some guy who is no longer with us, unfortunately, uh, up in Cupertino, <laughs> stole my idea and brought it to market and now uh, has made a lot of people billionaires. So if anybody asks who actually created the iPhone, you now know. Uh, and in fact, as far as I know, this is the first time, the very first book, that the iPhone was ever mentioned. Um, that's the truth, actually. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't get to claim that. So um, as, I, as I said, I'm going to tell you the story uh, of kind of my background and my story tonight. But I've really got three goals um, that I'm hoping that uh, uh, I can achieve uh, as it pertains to you uh, this evening. One is I'd like to inspire all of you to, uh, to take the entrepreneurial plunge. Now, I know uh, from a statistics perspective, that probably won't happen. But uh, if I can inspire just one of you to take that entrepreneurial plunge, as I'm sure that John's got the same goal, then that's something that uh, will make me very, very happy. Uh, two, I'm going to try to motivate you to take advantage of your time here at UCSB and to take advantage of the school resources uh, that you have access to. That includes your classmates, your professors, your libraries. Um, but really want to motivate, motivate you that if you're interested in entrepreneurship that you actually take advantage of your time here in school. And third, I just want to give you insights. And, you know, I want to provide some perspective, um, some knowledge based on my experiences of being an entrepreneur that hopefully um, you can take and they might be able to shape whether or not you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur as well. 
So if you've read the book, some of this might be a, a bit old hat, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and kind of fill you in on my background. I, uh, I left SMU in 1993 and became a consultant at Ernst & Young. So I took a information technology consulting job. I did that for four years, and it was, it was fine. I, I thought I learned a ton, and I enjoyed it. But I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what to do next. Uh, I didn't feel like I necessarily had the confidence to be an entrepreneur. Um, not only that, I didn't have any ideas. And even if I did, I'm not real sure I would know what to do with them. So I felt like I needed to go back to school. So I went to Wharton primarily because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And my sole purpose in going to Wharton was to come out of that school with ideas for starting a company. Now, the time that I went to, to Wharton was in 1997. And so that was a time when the dot-com boom was starting to take shape. Investment banking firms were hiring like crazy. Consulting firms were expanding. And what happened is when I got to Wharton my first year, I found that it was a little bit tough. And not tough in the sense that the curriculum was hard. It was tough in the sense that everybody there was really in this competitive battle uh, to see who could land the best job, the most high-paying job. Um, there were students sprawled across everywhere during the summer internship uh, interviewing process in my first year, practicing for case studies with the consulting firms. And so what happened when I was at Wharton is a lot of people who initially went to Wharton because they wanted to be entrepreneurs or they wanted to go start nonprofits, they got caught up in this sort of rat race. Um, they got caught up in this herd mentality that, hey, in order to pr prove myself, I've got to go take that banking job. And not only that, a lot of people were in debt going to school and they felt like they needed to cover their expenses by taking jobs with companies that might pay their their tuition for two years in business school. So when I got to Wharton, I kind of realized this, and I, I said to myself, you know, I don't want to get caught up in this. You know, I came here with a sole purpose, and that was to become an entrepreneur. I don't want to get caught up and end up at Goldman Sachs. I don't want to be caught up at going back into consulting. I want to do my own thing. So what I did coming out of my, uh, my first year is I joined the Wharton Small Business Development Center. And the Wharton Small Business Development Center was a joint venture between the University of Pennsylvania and the Small Business Administration. And it basically, it was set up so that undergraduate and graduate students who worked there could provide consulting services for free to local businesses in the Philadelphia community. I took that job as my summer internship, and I took it as a part-time job working 20 hours a week my second year in business school. The reason I took that job was so I'd be solely focused on entrepreneurship. And it would take me away from that rat race to kind of go join those bigger companies, even the dot-coms that were actually hiring at the time. So I was really, really focused on, on becoming an entrepreneur. And I felt pretty good about the fact that I kind of took myself out of that rat race. The problem <laughs> is that despite the fact that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and despite the fact that I surrounded myself with the right people, you know, with the right roles and the right job during my first and second year, the big problem I had is that toward the second year, toward the end of my second year, I really didn't have any ideas. Um, I didn't really want to go join somebody else's company. And so I was kind of stuck in this limbo state where I still wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't know what to do. Uh, now comes the idea. So my roommate at the time was a guy named Kyle Harrison, who's also a co-author of the book. Kyle and I were batting around um, you know, entrepreneurial worries in terms of what we wanted to do. And we happened to be taking a marketing class with a guy named Lynn Lodish. And part of the, the assignment in that class was to, to develop a, a marketing plan for, a, for an idea. So Kyle and I sat around and we thought, okay, what kind of idea can we come up with and develop for a marketing plan? And we came up with the idea for Mouse Driver. And uh, the reason we came up with this idea was because Kyle had this patent that he had developed prior to business school, which I'm completely convinced he developed the patent so he'd have some fodder for his essay um, during the application process for Wharton. But uh, we looked at this patent and said, okay, let's put a marketing plan around Mouse Driver. We really had no intention of bringing Mouse Driver to market. The only intention we really had was getting through this marketing class that Lynn Lodish was teaching. So we presented the idea uh, for Mouse Driver in Lynn Lodish's class. And it was met, met with some relatively high enthusiasm, but nothing that would tell us, hey, go do this. But what we did was we ended up using that idea in a number of other courses that we were taking that second semester. The reason we kept using it for these other courses was not because we thought it'd be a phenomenal idea again. It was because we'd already done half the work, and we might as well keep continue doing the work for these other classes. So it was a, it was a way for us to, in some ways, um, kind of skate through our second semester for a few classes at Wharton. But what we found was that the more we presented the idea, the more we shared it with others, the more people liked it. So just so you know what the idea was, if you're not familiar with what a mouse driver is, this is a mouse driver. It's a computer head shaped like the head of a driver golf club. 
If there are any golfers in here, this should look very, very eerily familiar to a Big Bertha driver golf club, which is exactly what it was modeled after um, when we first brought our, our product to market. But we're not talking about some multi-billion dollar complex technology idea here. We're talking about a computer mouse shaped as the head of a driver golf club. It's really more like a tchotchke gift item than anything else. So when you think about entrepreneurship, don't think that you have to come up with these massive harebrained complex ideas to be an entrepreneur. You can be an entrepreneur and have you know, something as you know, simple as a pencil and bring it to market. But this was our idea, and the more we pitched it to our, our friends at Wharton, our classmates, and our professors, the more people told us it was a great idea. And in fact, Lynn Lodish thought it was such a good idea that he actually challenged us to bring it, bring it to market. And this was in a, around April of 1999, right around the time we were about to graduate, and right around the time that you know, the final offers were going out for all the big companies. And Lynn's rationale was pretty simple. He said, listen, you know, I know that all these jobs are out there for you. I know all these dot-coms are hiring. But I think you're going to learn a lot more about business, and I think you're going to learn a lot more about yourselves if you actually work to bring this product to market. And he was so sure of that that he offered to give us $10,000 in seed, num seed money to go develop the prototype for Mouse Driver. And so the, the sun and the stars and the moon must have been aligned at that point in time because Kyle and I jumped right on it. We said, you know what, Len's right. Let's go bring this thing to market. We've been working on it for the last couple of months. Let's go make this thing happen. And so we had this feeling of this is what we need to do. And if you're an entrepreneur, and a lot of you I know are probably going through this thought of how do you know when to cross the line? The best way I can say this is, it, is that when you're, when you're an entrepreneur and you've, you're locked onto your idea, you just know when it's the time to cross the line. You just know it's the right idea and you know when to make that leap. So Kyle and I got to this point where we knew we needed to make the leap. So the next thing we did was we kind of set our goals. All right, we're going to start this company. What are we going to do? Well, first we moved to San Francisco. And the reason we moved to San Francisco is not because that's the best place to bootstrap a novelty tchotchke mouse out of your apartment, which is what we did, but we felt like it was a risk mitigation strategy. And when I talk about risk mitigation, we felt like if we really sucked at being entrepreneurs, or if our mouse driver completely flopped, we could just walk on to any company in San Francisco at the time. It was 1999. I mean, all you had to do was kind of walk, breathe, and say you had a degree from somewhere, and someone would hire you for like six figures. I mean, it was, it was that crazy. I think most of you are too young to remember it, but I know. I know John remembers it, but it was, um, it was like a make-believe world at that time. So we, uh, we moved out to, uh, to San Francisco, and we really put together our goals. So when you talk about putting together goals, obviously you talk about putting together your projections. Well, we had, we had really two primary goals with Mouse Driver. Uh, well, I'll say three. One was we didn't want to be in business for longer than four years. So we weren't trying to build a sustainable, long-term company. We knew we wanted to bring a product to market, sell as much as possible, and then hopefully sell the company to somebody else. Two, we wanted to do uh, $10 million in sales um, by our fourth year, meaning that we wanted to have $10 million in sales cumulative by our fourth year. And that was a big, big goal for us. And then the last goal was that we did want to sell the company. And we, we thought we could sell it to a company um, that had bigger distribution channels than that we, we had. So these were our initial projections. Um, you can notice there that it has your, your prototypical hockey stick that goes straight up. Um, you know, doing roughly a half a million dollars in sales in our first year, so after launching the product. And then growing to uh, a mere $10 million in sales in our fourth year. So um, this was your, again, your prototypical hockey stick that you would expect to see out of any entrepreneur's projections and financials. The problem with these projections and these, these financials is that they were kind of wrought with challenges and they were wrought with naivety. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and admit that Kyle and I were pretty, pretty naive with these projections um, and with starting this business and, and really understanding what we thought we could do. And I'll blame part of that on, on us. Actually, I'll blame most of it on us. But I'll also blame part of it on the, on the time and the economy and where we were coming from. When you're, when you're coming out of a school like Wharton, um, they kind of put you on this pedestal. And so when you graduate from, from a two-year program and get your MBA, for, for me, coming out of Wharton, I, I was kind of made to believe that no matter what I did, it was going to turn to gold. Um, so we just kind of felt like because we went to Wharton, it would be incredibly successful. Um, the second thing was at the time, um, as I mentioned earlier, 1999, you could almost write a business plan, get funded, and make millions of dollars. And so it was kind of this weird, weird time in history where 
you know, companies were, were getting funded going public with like no revenue. Um, and so you had these kind of two things coming together plus our own naivety that led us to believe that we could actually hit these projections. But we started the company and we bootstrapped it in San Francisco and we ran into all sorts of crazy challenges. Um, our very first shipment of mouse drivers, apparently Typhoon York sunk our, or didn't sink our boat, but caused this massive storm off the coast of Korea and our container fell off the ship and we lost our, our first order of, uh, of mouse drivers. So that was a little bit heartbreaking. Um, when we finally got our first order of mouse drivers, we forgot that we should actually get a warehouse to store them in. So we had the UPS guy unload 5,000 mice at our apartment in San Francisco, um, which you know immediately the UPS guy doesn't like. You know you can't tell him to hey hold on we got to go figure out where to store these things. They drop them off in front of your apartment. So for six months we we had cardboard boxes of of mice stacked from floor to ceiling in our room and in our in our living room, uh, trying to figure out what we were going to do. And we found out at that point in time, it was just easiest for us to fulfill our own product. And so whenever we made a sale of mouse driver, Kyle and I would pull out one of the boxes, take out the product, box it up, write down the address, and put a stamp on it, and then call the UPS guy to come pick it up. We had this code with the UPS guy in Cow Hollow, in the area of San Francisco. He'd drive by our window. He'd honk. We knew it was him. And we'd either do this or give him the thumbs up. If we gave him the thumbs up, he would stop. If we gave him the circle, he would honk again and drive off. It's great. We had a personal relationship with the UPS guy. Um, but we had all sorts of you know, little things like that that we, we just didn't you know, recognize. You know, one of the big things that, uh, uh, that we realized pretty early on is that we had this ego. And we felt like because we went to Wharton, uh, people would listen to us. Um, they would get us into doors. Um, and we, we'd go meet with different retailers and just because we went to Wharton they would trust us and they'd buy our product and, and the problem there is one, none of the people we were talking to had ever heard of Wharton and two, they really wouldn't have cared. <laughs> All they cared about was do you have a good product that's going to sell and what's the price you're going to sell it to me at? So we had to learn pretty quickly that we had, we had to drop our ego um, and it was hard to do because again, think of the time, 1999, here we are coming out of Wharton thinking that no matter what we're going to do, it's going to turn to gold. And here we are, we're having golf pros tell us, you know what, you guys aren't going to make it. And you're just looking at the guy going, are you kidding me? You know, I went to Wharton. It was, that, that was hard. You know, but, but when we took a step back and realized, hey, if we can, if we can drop our ego and just, and just listen a little bit, um, we might actually learn something from these folks that were, were giving us all these different insights. So we had all these different challenges that were coming up. But the biggest one was really more of a self-worth challenge. And this was really a sign of the times. Uh, if you've read the book, you, you know that uh, Kyle was also part of another startup coming out of Wharton called PayMyBills.com. And PayMyBills went on to raise $20 million in funding in their first round and then another $15 million in funding in their second round. So their first round, they, they, they raised two months after we graduated. And this is when Kyle and I were literally stacking mice up in our apartment um, trying to figure out how we're going to sell these things. But uh, when Pay My Bills started advertising on billboards on Highway 101, uh, we, we really started to question, you know, what in the world were we doing? Um, you know, what in the world have we, have we done with our, our degree that we've just spent $100,000 on, um, you know, with all this knowledge? Because as all of our friends who were in banking or in consulting or even in dot coms, they were all just bringing down all this money. The dot coms were going public. People were becoming paper, paper millionaires. And Kyle and I were trying to hawk a computer mouse that looked like the head of a driver golf club. And, and, and we just, it was hard, man. We were just sitting there in that apartment, right? It's like blazing hot. We've got computers. We've got mice. You know, we're typing away in a kitchen. And it was, it was tough, right? And so we were always looking for things that sort of just keep us going and to keep us going. And that, that's the hard thing about entrepreneurship is it, it's wrought full of highs and lows. And no matter what, you've always got to keep going. If you ever get to the point where you've lost that passion and you've lost that motivation, that's when you've got to kind of take a step back and say, is this really right for me or is it time to get out? Because if you don't have that passion and that motivation, getting out of those lows is really, really tough. At the same time, and this is really around the summer of 1999, what happens in business school, if you, if you land that job with, call it Goldman Sachs, you know, they, they give you this, you know, in addition to giving you a salary and, 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 and paying your tuition, they also give you this crazy bo bonus just for coming on board. And what most people do between, you know, the end of graduation and uh, starting their new job in September, they go and travel the world. So they spend like two, three, four months just blowing their bonus traveling the world, which is exactly how I'd blow my bonus as well if I was given that much money. 
But we had a lot of people emailing us from their travels in Africa and in India and Tahiti and the Cook Islands and wherever saying, are you guys really going to bring that mouse driver thing to market? Um, are, you, are, you, are you really doing this? Because if you are, I'd love to be, you know, you know, I'd love for you to keep me posted on what's going on because I just can't believe you're doing this. And it was almost like a cry for help from some of these folks. Now, some of them really wanted to know, like, you guys are crazy, but you know, keep me posted on what happens. But a lot of them, I think, were a little bit envious um, because they had gone to Wharton with this idea of becoming an entrepreneur, but then they got sucked into that, uh, you know, that whole rat race, and they really wanted to see what we made out of this thing. And we kept getting these emails. And, and so finally, Kyle and I said to each other, well, you know, we got to keep them updated. Um, and I was like, well, yeah, you know, let's, let's, maybe we can start a newsletter. We'll just, you know, update them on a, on a monthly basis. And Kyle and I, by this point in time, had started chronicling our, uh, our sort of our, our daily exploits uh, in a Word document. You know, every day we would just bullet out what happened on that day. And the reason we were doing this was because it was kind of therapeutic for us. Um, we, again, we just couldn't believe what we were, we were going through, right? We were going to these trade shows and, you know, the, the guy next to us was selling logoed condoms and here we are selling our mouse driver and we're just like, you know, what's happening, right? And, and we just started bulleting things out and, um, you know, we felt like we could use some of these bulleted things that we were doing and, and put together a newsletter. So we, we sent this newsletter out to about 35 people. It was, it was an invite and it primarily went to our friends from Wharton and our family. And was, you know, I, I sent this out and I said, hey, listen, we're going to start writing this news, newsletter and it's going gonna, it's gonna to highlight our trials and our tribulations, our failures and our successes. It's going to highlight our emotions, our ups and our downs. If you, if you, you know, want to keep up, a, if you want to be kept informed, just send me an email and let me know that you're in. And that was it. And of those 35 people, of course, you know, we sent it to the people who've been asking to be kept posted in our family, so everybody opted in, right? And then we started sending out this newsletter. And this was uh, in September of 1999 when we started sending out the, the Mouse Driver Insider newsletter. And it was really no longer than a page, um, maybe a page and a half every now and then. It went out every three weeks. And it was really kind of the first form of you know, blogging, in a sense. Um, if I look back on it, if we had a blogging platform, we would have been blogging about this. Um, but that newsletter started to grow pretty quickly. Um, within three months, we had over 500 subscribers. And again, you had, to, you had to send me an email that said, I'm in. So we weren't marketing the newsletter. It was just out there sort of growing organically. And then someone would send me you know, their email that said, I'm in. I'd take their contact information. I would manage all this stuff in Microsoft Outlook, right? which only at that point in time, you could only store up like 100 names in one contact group. So I had like you know, multiple contact groups. <laughs> And the newsletter just started growing and growing and growing. And uh, what we found out through that newsletter is it became, again, not, o not only a therapeutic outlet for us, but it also became kind of our advisory board. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that, that Kyle and I made very, very early on was that we didn't really bring on any advisors to the company. And it wasn't from a lack of trying. We actually tried on a couple of different occasions um, to bring advisors onto the company, but when you when you bring advisors onto the company, but they show no interest in actually advising you, you typically let them go, and that's that's what we had to do. And by the time we realized that we you know we were we had lost a couple of advisors that we tried to bring onto the company, we we kind of felt like we didn't need any advisors, and we could just do this on our own. You know, we've got, been through this for you know six months, and we've learned a lot, and we don't need any advisors. Um, that's really. Um, not a good idea, by the way. Uh, definitely, definitely want to find advisors. I'll get into that in a second. But uh, the uh, the newsletter became sort of a de facto advisory board for us. We would send out some of our issues. We would highlight some of the problems and the challenges we were having with Mouse Driver, and all of a sudden people would respond. And I'm not talking about one or two people responding. We get 10, 15, 20 responses for a particular problem. I remember one, at one point in time, we had a hard time collecting from the May department stores. They owed us $100,000, and we weren't really sure what to do, and we really needed the money. And we, we talked about that in the, in the newsletter, and we had like 12 or 13 responses from people saying, you need to contact so-and-so because they're a collections agent dealing with the May department stores. They can get your money back. And they were right. So we were, we were connected to people that helped us get our money back. So it served as kind of a de facto advisory board. So in a sense, we, we crowdsourced our advisory board, and it worked, uh, it worked phenomenally well. But the newsletter um, you know, started to grow, and as the newsletter grew, Kyle and I started to overcome some of the challenges that we had. Our biggest challenge was really distribution. You know, how do you actually take the product that you've just made 
and get it into your customer's hands. You know, one of the fallacies that, or one of the, you know, the assumptions that we made early on was that we were going to sell a ton of these things online. And this again was in 1999. Even though the internet existed and people were selling stuff online, it wasn't like e-commerce is today. And so I think we probably sold 10 mouse drivers online in total um, during the life of the business. <laughs> but that was going to be our biggest channel. When that didn't work, we had to go out and build our own distribution channels. And building distribution is not easy, um, especially if you've got, you know, if you're two people trying to build out your own distribution channels in industries that you don't really have that much experience in. It's it's not a, it's not an easy task. But Kyle and I did it. Uh, we ended up signing up Brookstone, which was one of our bigger clients. We signed up Homaker Schlimmer, uh, the PGA Tour shops, uh, the May Department Stores, who still owes us $100,000. Filene's basement, um, and then we also signed on Walmart at one point in time, um, which was a huge disaster because they sucked to work with, but um, we did sign them on, and, and it was a nice uh, sort of feather uh, in the cap for us. But, uh, you know, we perse persevered, you know, and we, we hit all these challenges, and we got our egos crushed, and, you know, we went into credit card debt. Uh, you know, this wasn't the type of business that you were going to go find lots of investors for. We probably could have, but it wasn't like a VC deal. Um, plus, we didn't want to give away the company. We weren't going to hit up our parents for any more money because they'd already put in, like, collectively between our parents, uncles, and grandparents, like $50,000. Kyle and I had already put in a little bit of money as well. I mean, we'd already raised $75,000, and we didn't really feel comfortable going out and raising more money. You know, the banks, you know, Wells Fargo at the time was supposed to be the small business lender, but small business meant, like, you'd been in business for, like, 10 years and had, like, $10 million in revenue. So, you know, getting money from them was not going to happen. You know, we heard about, you know, manufacturers in China potentially helping to fund businesses. And we brought that up with our manufacturer, and they kind of laughed, said, yeah, that never happens. <laughs> um, so the only option we really had at this point was to fund everything on credit cards. And so uh, Kyle and I uh, put about $200,000 on our credit cards to really fund our inventory uh, investments, you know, and so we were literally taking money out of our credit cards and funding it that way. And, and it seems scary right now, and actually I would never do it again. Um, but it, we were very, very passionate, and we knew we could make that money up. And so there was no doubt as to whether or not Mouse Driver was going to be successful for us. But also, it was a little bit of a different financial market at the time, which I'm sure will never happen again in anybody's lifetime. But um, you could play like, you know, the, the credit card game. So I could put $20,000 on one card, you know, and then $20,000 on seven other cards. Right? And then I could go to one company and say, hey, I've got $120,000 in credit card debt. What if I bring it all over to you? What kind of interest rate can you give me? And they would say, well, you can give you 4.9%. So then I'd take that information. I'd go to another credit card company. And they'd say, well, we can give it to you for 3.9%. So Kyle and I just kind of played this game and just kept moving our, our balance over to different credit cards. And this was before there were balance transfer fees. Right? This was, they were just trying to get the business. So there, there were no balance transfer fees. So we literally had, like, I think our average interest rate on this debt was like a little over 2%. Um, and in fact, and in fact, my wife Rhonda will attest to this, I've still got, <laughs> you guys are going to laugh at this, I've still got $5,000 in credit card debt on one of those credit cards at 0.9%. And it was my it was my school loan. I moved when I when I figured out I could do this. I moved all my school loans to a credit card. I had seventy five thousand dollars in school loans left, and I and I got it point nine percent, which I still have because there's no point in paying it off, right? Because I'm <laughs> not getting charged for it. I can make that money, and even now my my RMA makes more money. So we overcame a lot of our challenges. Not to say we overcame all the challenges, but. Um, we persevered. You know, we figured out a way of getting money, even if it was credit card debt. We figured a way of, um, of uh, building out our distribution channels. Um, you know, but we also couldn't overcome challenges. I mean, it was really, really hard for us to overcome the, count, the challenge of, you know, being prudent and, and bootstrapped. And, and in some cases, you can be way too prudent, you know. And in some cases, you actually do need money to um, to build a business or to sell a product. And looking back, in hindsight, uh, I think I actually would have been more aggressive in terms of hiring salespeople. Um, I think I would have been more, uh, more aggressive in, in uh, offering discounts for the product. I think I would have been more aggressive in terms of actually trying to build a small sales force um, you know, within our, our own con confines there in San Francisco. So there are certain things that you learn in hindsight, and I think we could have been more aggressive because at some point in time, it, it may take money to fuel a business. Uh, most businesses, despite you know, some of the success stories you hear out there like Google, you know, Facebook, um, you know, don't just start and become, you know, these massive businesses overnight. It takes a lot of time. 
but we, we, we continue to, to, to grow the business. And, and as the newsletter grew, the media kind of picked up on the story as well. And, uh, you know, we, we, I think it was about, uh, I'd say September, it was around September of 2000 when our newsletter growth hit about 2,000 people. We had professors around the country asking us to come speak to their classes. And the media started picking, hold, uh, picking up of the story. And, and, it and it wasn't the media coming to us and saying, wow, this is the best product ever, and you guys are just killing it. It was more about, wow, we've heard about your newsletter, and it seems to be motivating and inspiring entrepreneurs around the country. We'd love to talk to you about it. So the media started picking up on the story and about how the Mouse Driver Insider newsletter was really inspiring folks. And it was inspiring folks from the universities to professors to VCs to entertainers to bankers, to other entrepreneurs, and that's what the media kind of picked up on. And in uh, February of 2001, uh, Inc. Magazine ended up doing a, uh, a cover story on, on Kyle and I called An American Startup. And uh, the, again, the, the story wasn't about how our product was just knocking it out of the park, um, although our product was growing in terms of sales. Uh, it, was about our, it was just about our, our newsletter and how we weren't afraid to kind of put things out there and to talk about how hard it was to be an entrepreneur and how our story resonated with about 98% of the, of the population of entrepreneurs out there because we didn't take on VC money. We pretty much funded it with our own money. We were starting it out of our apartment, um, and we were bringing an idea that we had for just a simple product to market, and that really resonated with most of the American entrepreneurs out there. So the media picked up on it, and as the, the media picked up on the story, naturally we started getting all this product awareness, right? And Mouse Driver became, you know, I'm not going to say a household name by any stretch of the imagination, but people started to know about Mouse Driver, uh, and they started to tie Mouse Driver to the story of John and Kyle, you know, and our our emotional roller coaster of being entrepreneurs, you know. And as that story got out there, we got all this increased awareness, um, we got increased product distribution, and our revenue started to cr slowly, uh, you know, slowly crawl up. Um, it's kind of the power of, of of PR, right? People start talking about your product. And there's this theory that if people start talking about your product, then naturally they want to know about it and they're going to buy it. Um, and that theory typically works if you, if you have a product out there that people know where to get. You know, for us, we had all this phenomenal media coverage, um, but, our, but our product wasn't really completely out there. Yes, we were in Brookstone, we were a handful of Walmarts and a couple of department stores, but it wasn't easy for the, the average consumer to go a actually go buy our product. It was available online, but again, e-commerce had, hadn't really kicked up in 1999 yet. So there was a distribution problem here. Had we penetrated all the distribution channels that we could, if this awareness came out, I feel like we'd have done a lot more in terms of revenue and sales. But you know, the story got out there. Our newsletter completely took off. Um, you know, Once the Inc. article came out, uh, we went from 5,000 to 7,500 to 10,000 subscribers in, in less than like six months. Um, and I call these folks raving fans because all they did was talk about Mouse Driver. And every time we put out a newsletter, we would just get these crazy responses. You know, we got so many responses that Kyle and I were trying to figure out, what do we do with all these people? Because we, we found ourselves connecting a bunch of people. Like, somebody would come back to us and say, hey, I had this problem that you're having with manufacturing, you know, and I know you solved this problem with collections. Can you put me in touch with the right person? And we'd say, oh, sure. We make all these introductions. So we tried to figure out, how do we bring all these connections out there together in one area? Um, to, uh, to you know, kind of, so they could all network together. And this again, this is 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, and so we thought the answer was a forum, and so we put this forum out there, and the forum really didn't do anything. And then, you know, right around the time we actually ended up closing shop on Mouse Driver, social networking came out, um, and that would have been, you know, huge for us had we had the opportunity to actually build that. We could have had a Facebook, you know, group around Mouse Driver, which would have done phenomenally well. But the uh, the newsletter grew, um, you know, product sales grew, and and, and and Kyle and I continued to try to overcome all the different challenges that we were having. But the, uh, the biggest story out of all this is once, that, once the, the media kind of picked up on it, every major publishing house out there also picked up on the story. And so we were getting calls from like, you know, Time Warner and HarperCollins and Harvard Business Press and Perseus, you know, saying, hey, we want to pay you to write a book. And so Kyle and I sat down for about 30 seconds and said, do we want to do this? Yeah, let's do it because if we have a book out there, it's more awareness for the product and we'll sell, we'll sell more mouse drivers. So we sat down and we put together our book proposal and I flew out to New York and met with a bunch of publishers and sure enough, they said, hey, we want to pay you to write a book. I'm like, great, but I don't know how to write. And they're like, oh, yes, you do. We want you to write it just like you do the newsletters. You mean just like I talk? Yeah. All right, fine. So I sat down and um, I started spending about 
I'd say 50% of my time um, writing the book. And that was over about a six month period. And so uh, we wrote the book, submitted it to the editor for editing, and then um, you know, kind of waited for it to, to, to come out and hit the shelves. Um, it was a phenomenal experience uh, sitting down and writing the book, but the, uh, the problem there is that I was in charge of sales and marketing, and um, you know, all, all the time that I was spending writing the book was, was not being spent trying to sell product. So um, you know, we had this nice little growth tick of mouse drivers that immediately went like this as soon as I started uh, writing the book. So there was a, a little bit of a, of a trade-off there in terms of the, the book uh, versus product sales because you know, resor resourcing and my time and what I was putting my time to. But the book came out in, um, I believe, January of 2002. It hit a number of bestseller lists. Um, you know, a number of different uni universities sort of picked it up as required reading right out of the gate. And Kyle and I, when we, when we sat down to write the book, we really wanted to write a book that we could have used. Uh, and we wanted a book that was real. You know, we, went, we didn't want a, a book of, you know, uh, Michael Dell talking about how he knew he was going to start a multi-billion dollar company at one point in time. And we didn't want to read another book about, you know, Bill Gates and how, you know, Microsoft was something that just, you know, kind of happened overnight. And, you know, we didn't want to write one of those books because we feel like a lot of those stories are complete anomalies. You know, I, I, and I hate to break it to you, and I think John probably mentioned it, the, the chances of any of you starting like the next Google or Facebook or Apple or Microsoft um, are probably pretty slim. Um, that stuff just doesn't happen. But we, we did want to write about the, the journey of entrepreneurship. You know, and the emotional highs and lows, and the the ultimate um, feeling that you get when you're an entrepreneur and you're doing your own thing. We wanted people to understand that, and we wanted people to understand that before they went and hit the entrepreneurial experience, because we felt like we had a lot to tell, and we really wanted to encourage people to do what we'd done. You know, despite the fact that we had all these highs and lows, we felt like we had learned so much about ourselves, and we kept going back to Lynn Lodish's initial comments to us, which was, you're going to learn a lot more about your ser yourself, not only from a business perspective, but also from a personal perspective. And he was dead on. I mean, that, that, the, the four years that we spent with Mouse Driver, we learned you know, everything we learned in business school and then some, especially around common sense and street smarts and how to read people. And these are just things that you don't get when you're at a corporation. And these are things that are going to help you in everyday life. When you're an entrepreneur, you're put in situations that test you that you would never be tested in such a way. It's almost like doing an endurance race. I, 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 I used to be an adventure racer and, and did stuff like 24-hour you know, and 72-hour races and stuff like that. And you don't have to be in tip-top shape for those races, but what you have to know is how does your body react when you're, you're dehydrated and you're hungry and you haven't slept for 30 hours? Entrepreneurship is kind of the same way. How do you react in certain stressful situations? And you just don't put yourself in those situations when you're kind of in a normal job most of the time. Um, and so we, we learned what to do in those different situations. And it was a phenomenal experience. And of course, the book did help us in, increase sales. And that was, that was something that um, you know, we, we certainly enjoyed. But again, we could have increased a lot more had we had the distribution, had I been actually focused on sales like I probably should have been instead of writing the book. So the book came out in 2002. And it was right about this time, you know, we were starting to see, um, you know, sales sort of slip. And Kyle and I felt like it was, about, it was time to start winding down the company. And this was right around our three and a half year mark. So it was pretty good timing. And we knew we wanted to get out um, in four years. So we started shopping the company around. And uh, as we were starting to shop the company around, you know, an amazing thing happened with the book and the fact that, you know, people were really starting to buy it and they liked it. So I ended up going on the speaking circuit and getting paid to actually talk about the experience I just had, which is brilliant, right? You can go out and people will pay you to just talk about what you've written about. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> um, the, the problem with that is it only lasts as long as your book's like on the, the best selling list. And then as soon as you get replaced, it's like your 10 minutes of fame, right? You get replaced and then nobody wants you. But for, you know, for six to nine months, it was awesome. Because I could, you know, I flew, flew around and we had a, we had a publicist with our, uh, our book publisher who set up all these speaking engagements and I would go around and I'd talk and I'd be like, this is great, you know, and I'd make some money and I'd put it back into the company and I, I would call that sales even though it wasn't product sales. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how, how I justified it. Uh, but it was a great experience, but uh, it was also, um, you know, a, a time when both Kyle and I realized we needed to move on. You know, and again, we went back to our original goals and this is something I would encourage you all to do, obviously, before you embark on your entrepreneurial experience, you, you need to have certain goals. Of course, you need to have a vision, right? And, and our vision was to get in and get out in kind of four years and sell as much as possible. But we really stuck to that goal. Um, and so when we were getting to that point, we started, we put the company on, on, on the market and we ended up 
um, you know, selling the company for $50,000, and that was an asset sale, meaning that we basically just sold the IP rights, um, you know, intellectual property rights, and the, uh, the patent, and, and we sold it to a larger golf gift, well, it was actually a gift distributor who focused on golf gifts out of Yonkers, New York, and that money was just enough money to sort of pay off our investors, um, including ourselves, and so it wasn't like we, we crushed it uh, with Mouse Driver. I, th I think in the, uh, the grand scheme of things, I'd call this a, a solid single in terms of businesses, if you're using baseball terms. Um, but again, the, the learning that we got out of it from a personal business perspective was a home run because you just can't recreate that experience anywhere else. But if you want to look at sort of the, uh, the numbers, um, you remember the projections that we put together? <laughs> this is what we did. Um, we did $1.6 million in revenue. Uh, we did it over a little over 100,000 units sold. Um, we maintain 68% gross margins, so that's pretty sick gross margins, which leaves a lot of room to go through all sorts of different distribution channels. And we sold it for $50,000. Now I'm gonna say something right here. I keep talking about had we built out distribution channels, um, we would have had more revenue. If I had been focused on sales, we'd have had more, we would have had more revenue. Um, so I'm about, I think, 10 years removed from the mouse driver experience, and I look back at that $1.6 million number, and I'm actually shocked we were able to do that much in revenue. Just knowing the challenges that we, we faced um, and knowing how hard it is now, 10 years after, to build out distribution and to make sales, like, I'm shocked that, that we were able to even do, do that. And that was just a, a testament at the time in our passion and our, our perseverance and our, you know, and our confidence that we can make this work. And, and that's what you need, you know. With, with, you see so many different entrepreneurs out there that may not have the best product because they persevere. You know, they stay with it, they're able to, to succeed. And that's essentially what we did. So when I look at that number, I actually, there's a lot of pride with that number because I look at it, I'm like, wow, that's, knowing what I know now, that's, I mean, that's $1.6 million is a decent, a decent chunk of change. That's a lot of money, you know. So we were pretty stoked with that. Uh, with that. So we, we sold the company and then, uh, I was talking to a group of uh, uh, students before this, and, and we both kind of went on our, our career paths, and, and both of us needed a little bit of a reprieve. You know, after going you know, $200,000 in a credit card debt and experiencing all the emotional highs and lows of bringing a product to market, we kind of wanted to just sort of relax. I, I didn't want to bootstrap another company at that point in time, but I really wanted to learn how to, how to scale a sales and marketing organization because I felt like that's where I could have done better with Mouse Driver, hence the fact that I'm telling you right now that I should have been selling instead of writing. And so I took a job at Microsoft in Seattle uh, in their sales and marketing organization to really help them scale this new business and to learn how to hire and to lead and to manage. And I thought I'd be at Microsoft for maybe, maybe one year, two years, and I'd come back to San Francisco and start my next company. Well, I ended up at Microsoft for four years, which was really two years too long, um, and left Microsoft in 2007 to join an internet publishing company called whitepages.com. After four years at Microsoft, I really had to get out of there. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and when you get into big companies, it, it's just, it, it really is a slow, painful death if you're an entrepreneur, because you just want to do things fast, and you want to do things quick, and you want to test, and you don't want to have to go through bureaucracies, and you don't want to have to have every single email you send out to customer be reviewed by a legal team. Um, it's just hard, and so it, there, there was a lot of, you know, sort of internal conflict with me being at a big company, but yet wanting to be a small business person. So I left Microsoft and went to whitepages.com, which wasn't a startup, but it was a 120-person, $50 million publishing company that sold ads online. So if you're familiar with White Pages, whitepages.com is very similar. It's just all online. I went there to learn marketing, and I, I really went there to learn online marketing. So everything from you know, search engine optimization and pay-per-click and display advertising and retargeting and social media. These are a lot of the different skill sets that I picked up while I was at, uh, at White Pages. But after a couple of years at White Pages, I got bored. Um, I just, you know, I wasn't having that much fun and, and it wasn't exciting and it wasn't challenging. I didn't feel like I was, you know, essentially following my passion. So I left White Pages in, uh, in October of 2009. And again, I took some time off to take a reprieve and try to figure out what it is I wanted to do, to do next. And when I left White Pages, I actually had three job offers. And so take, take you back to the reason why I went to Wharton and the fact that I didn't want a job. I had these th three job offers on the table, and Rhonda and I were looking at these job offers, and I looked at her and I just said, none of these excite me, I don't, I don't want a job. You know, I wanna go do my own thing. And all of a sudden, she reminded me that that's what I said in my book, and next thing you know, I'm reading my own book <laughs> 10 years later, and reading it, and it's weird, you know, 10 years later after you write a book like this, you read it and you're, you're kind of a third party. 
So now when I read this thing, I'm like, oh, these guys are jackasses. What, what, are, they, <laughs> what are they doing? It, it's kind of weird. So I started reading the book again, and it started fueling my passion to be an entrepreneur. So I said to myself, you know, and I was talking with Ron, and I'm like, you know, I need to buy some time. So I took some interim CMO position with the startups in Seattle. Um, I consulted for a couple of different companies. Um, I actually, you know, ironically trained Microsoft, um, you know, executives on how to be better marketers. And I was really just kind of buying my time until the next opportunity showed up. And then in uh, January of 2011, um, the opportunity kind of presented itself. And a, a friend of mine, who's an investor in the Bay Area, is a guy named Steve Anderson. And Steve started a. Uh, a seed angel investment fund called Baseline Ventures, and he started it with a guy named Ron Conway <clears throat> in San Francisco. And I, I knew Ron and Steve from my time in San Francisco, and, and they would always reach out to me and kind of uh, ask me what I was doing and what I was interested in. And, and Steve came to me in uh, January of 2011 and said, well, you know, what do you think about the eyewear industry? And I looked at him and I said, no, I, I don't. He's like, well, I think there's opportunity here. So he and I started researching the eyewear industry and, and trying to get a better sense of, uh, of um, you know, what was going on in the industry, and we realized that there was a phenomenal opportunity to, uh, to sell prescription eyewear online. And so uh, we did all of our competitive research and did a lot more research and focus groups and surveys and interviews and decided to start a company called Rivet and Sway, which sells prescription eyewear online to women. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But uh, long story short is, you know, even though I wanted to be an entrepreneur over the 10 years, I didn't, I didn't necessarily force it. You know, I, I could have joined uh, you know, a, a small company or a startup. Um, I could have tried to go force myself into entrepreneurship, but I was patient because I wanted to make sure whatever I did was something I was passionate about. The one thing that I did learn with Mouse Driver, again, talking about the highs and lows, is that when you hit those lows, if you're really not passionate about what you're doing in some sort of way, um, it's going to be really, really hard to pick yourself up from those lows. So I wanted to wait until I actually found something I was passionate about. And with Rivet and Sway, I, you know, 10 years after leaving Mouse Driver, I finally found something that I was actually passionate about doing. If I have to leave you with sort of, you know, words of wisdom, if you go, if you go to mousedriverchronicles.com, which is this very old, antiquated, 1999 looking website, which is still out there, um, you can run into all the different newsletters uh, that we wrote. And, and we have some different words of wisdom. So there's probably 20 different words of wisdom. But if I'm picking out five that I think are very, very poignant, um, uh, to you today, uh, the first would be to, to take advantage of, of your school resources. Um, you, you've probably heard this, but there really is no better time to start a business when you're in school, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, um, your risk, your tolerance for risk is a lot higher, because once you start making money, it just becomes a little bit harder to sort of stop making money and change your li lifestyle to potentially become an entrepreneur. But more importantly, you have access to tons of resources. You have accesses, access to professors like, you know, Professor Greathouse. You have access to really, really smart students. You have access to library databases. You have access to school resources. And you also have access to classes in which you might be in a position where you can you know, talk about this idea and get feedback and insights and perspectives. But I would highly encourage you to take advantage of school resources if you have an idea. Because it's just uh, you know, no better place to try, to try to look at that idea, idea and really determine, hey, is this idea for me? And do I really want to go do it? The second thing, and I mentioned this earlier, is find an advisor. And it, finding an advisor doesn't have to be somebody who's been you know, crazy successful in business. It doesn't have to be somebody who's made millions of dollars. In fact, it could be somebody who's failed multiple times at being an entrepreneur. Just somebody who's been through some experiences, who can provide sage advice or insights or just knowledge. You know? Find somebody who can lend that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who's older than you either. You know, I've got mentors that I went to business school with who I call on all the time. A guy named Brett Hurt was one of the few guys that started a business out of Wharton when I did, and he just took his company, Bizarre Voice, public six months ago. You know, every now and then I go to him for advice because he's been through so much more than I have in terms of his entrepreneurial career, and it's great. So find that, th those advisors or that, or that advisor or that set of advisor or even that group of people that you can go to and, and ask for advice. Third, be patient. Um, there's not a lot of businesses that you can just launch overnight and all of a sudden they start making a lot of money uh, or they make any money. Um, you know, it takes time. You know, the, the, the fact that you know, you've got Zuckerbergs out there or Sergey Brands and Larry Pages of the world, it, it, those, aren't, those aren't normal cases. You know, they, just, they just aren't. But you've got to be patient and you've got to persevere because a lot of this stuff does take some time to actually um, you know, start to come to fruition and, and to get traction. Fourth, drop the ego and listen. This is probably the biggest lesson that I've learned um, you know, in my entrepreneurial career is, is you don't know everything. You know, even though it's your idea, 
Um, even though you have the vision, um, you're not going to know everything. And if you can get yourself to a point where you're accepting or you know, accepting of other people's thoughts um, and that you can actually truly listen to what they're saying, it's going to behoove you in so many great ways. So um, I'd encourage you to drop that ego and, and really listen to what other people are telling you. And then lastly, enjoy the ride. Um, you know, the, the entrepreneurial experience is, is unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it is a roller coaster ride. So if you like roller coasters, and you know, entrepreneurship is definitely for you. You know, if you like sort of stability and you kind of like just the day-to-day -day patterns of just kind of doing the same thing, you know, over and over, kind of like Groundhog Day, um, then entrepreneurship is probably not the best route. Um, but in terms of just excitement and energy and passion, you're, you're not going to beat it. It's just a fantastic ride. And even if you just do it once and you say, you know what, it's not for me, at least you've done it, you know, and you've experienced those things that, you know, you're not going to necessarily experience anywhere else. So those are the kind of the words of wisdom that I'd, that I'd like to leave you, um, leave you with. And then I wouldn't be a true entrepreneur unless I was self-promoting my company. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, I started a company called Rivet and Sway, and we sell prescription eyewear uh, primarily to women. In fact, we only sell to women, and so our entire offering is, is focused to women, but we've launched online. And you can find uh, our site and our offering at rivetandsway.com. So if you're interested in, in, in seeing what I'm doing next, this is it. And this is what I've launched with uh, a couple of uh, um, Bay Area investors, um, and we launched three months ago. So um, as my offer to UCSB students, um, if you use the code USB, UCSB SWAYS, and you can forward that to anybody you want, um, I'll give you 50% off uh, the prescription purchase. And right now they sell for $199. But at $199, that's about a $450 value. So you're really getting a $100 uh, uh, frame that costs $450 at retail. So I would encourage you to go check it out. And if you're interested in trying out the service, um, you've got a 50% off coupon right there. All right, well, I'm happy to. Uh, Answer any questions and So was Brian as big a douche as he seemed like he was? <laughs> and was Kenny as cool a guy as he seemed like he was? So let me take the latter. So uh, Kenny was you know unfortunately Kenny passed away of cancer um, about five years ago. Oh wow. Um, Kenny was unbelievably cool. And I, I can't tell you how lucky and fortunate we were to be connected with the manufacturers we were. Um, you know, knowing what I know now, it was, it, you know, there's a lot of luck involved with entrepreneurship, no matter how you slice it. I mean, luck is definitely part preparation and, and part perspiration, but, um, you know, we were definitely lucky with our manufacturing. And Kenny was incredibly cool, incredibly understanding. Um, he and his partner Carmine were awesome to work with. And in fact, it was Kenny who alerted us um, I won't go into it, but we got knocked off, and we fully expected to get knocked off. And it was Kenny who called us and said, hey, um, one of the companies that we actually work with came to us with your product today, and they want to knock you off. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he told them we can't do it, and then told us. So uh, he, was, he was awesome. And Brian, um, Brian was a nice guy. <laughs> he was a really nice guy, but uh, you know, one of the things we learned, and this is just, again, one of those life experiences, is, is that most sales folks will oversell and underdeliver. He was a nice guy, but he was just, it was, a, uh, it, was, it was a case of us not really knowing how to hire the right person.